Hello, hope all is well on this uh, Thursday evening. Um, today I'm going to go over Game 5 of the World Championship match between uh, Magnus Carlsen and Sergei Karyakin. Uh, before this round, uh, we've had four draws. Um, so the, the, each, each side was tied 2-2, two to two, and uh, it's the first to 6.5 points. So, uh, um, yeah, so essentially both sides had, uh, ha each had uh, white and white two times, and both sides had black two times. And uh, particularly in games three and four, um, Carlson was the one with the upper hand. Uh, in both uh, scenarios, he actually had winning positions um, and failed to convert them because Karakin was a very, very stubborn defender. And yesterday was a rest day. So uh, going into that rest day, or rather coming out of that rest day, I was really curious to see how Carlson would strike with the white pieces because he had certainly has played the better chess over the course of this event, but he, the results haven't uh, haven't uh, said that. So um, so uh, I was hoping that he would come out uh, a bit more fiery and um, and have something for Kayakin that would throw him a little bit off his trail. And uh, Kayakin after the first four games would have to be feeling pretty good because. Um, in spite of really suboptimal chess uh, for his standards, the match was still tied. So um, he'd proven that time and time again he could he could defend successfully. So, anyways, uh, Carlson went e4. Uh, I was actually very surprised by this choice. Um, I thought that uh, it was probably time to test uh, Sergei Karyakin's uh, Queen's Indian, which he's very much known for, and maybe go for a move like Knight f3 or c4 or d4, some non-e4 opening I was looking for, but I guess maybe saving the goods for later in the match. So e4, e5, uh, Kriakin opens with e5. Uh, if you recall, uh, the last black game in which he was defending heavily was a Berlin, so, um, so maybe he was willing to go back into that setup again because he really came out of the opening with no problems. And after e5, knight f3, knight c6, and here, Carlson deviated from the standard Berlin or Rui Lopez fodder by going bishop c4, which may be a surprise to some of our sort of uh, amateur audience out there, but I actually don't think this was much of a surprise to Kriakin. And the reason for this is twofold. One, uh, firstly, Carlson likes to get these flexible positions with the pieces on the board and slow, so slow developing. And the Italian game, which is... Uh, what he introduces by playing bishop c4 does exactly that. Um, you sort of have a slow maneuvering type of game that's not so critical, um, and that sort of fits his style. So I think it's something that was definitely uh, ex expected and at least examined by the Kriakin team before the match. Um, secondly, uh, uh, it's actually been the Italian game has actually been extremely popular across the board uh, at the top level in chess the past year or so as more players are trying to just find ways to get around Berlin, Berlin Rui Lopez's. So, uh, essentially, Karyakin actually won a great game on the white side of this position um, this year. Um, and so, it's just a very, very popular uh, setup now. And so, I actually, uh, I don't think it was a surprise at all. But uh, Bishop c4, Bishop c5, this is a standard uh, fodder. Um, I just want to point out here in the Italian game, um, uh, sometimes uh, knight takes e5 is an idea, but not here, because uh, after knight takes e5, knight takes e5, d4, um, the bishop and knight are attacked, but the bishop the bishop on c4 is hanging, so that's not possible. So, uh, uh, but anyways, it's, uh, uh, after, bishop, after knight bishop c5, there was castles, and then knight f6, and now d3. And d3 is sort of this sort of move that essentially uh, is consistent with the way Magnus likes to play chess and consistent with the match in general. Not taking a major stake in the center, trying to develop your pieces, and then seeing what's going on. And it's after d3, castles. And now uh, we saw the move a4. And the idea with a4 is actually just to seize space on the queen side and also give the bishop... Uh, a, a square on the diagonal where it can't be harassed by knight a5. As we've seen in many of the Roy Lopez structures, if it was uh, if we go back a move, if it was black to move again in this position, knight a5 may have been an idea uh, to secure the bishop 
even though this pawn is hanging, it, it still sometimes is an idea. Um, so, okay, probably d6 would have been played first, but knight a5 is always a move that's in the cards. So a4 just gives the bishop more space on the diagonal. And then after d6, uh, which Car Carol can play just getting uh, the last of the pieces out, uh, Carlson went c3. And c3 actually uh, not only effectively covers the d4 square, but also uh, uh, threatens uh, to play b4 and a5, trapping uh, the dark squared bishop on c5. And this is still pretty standard fodder. And uh, But I just also want to comment on sort of the, the thematics of the position because it's relatively symmetrical. So what white is trying to do in this variation of the Italian game with early a4 uh, and c3 is not only c space on the queen side, but also sort of uh, just get get good activity and restrict the play of the of the knight on c6. If you notice, the knights on f3 and f6 are symmetrical. Actually, it's completely symmetrical from the e file onward uh, e to the e to the h file. The real difference here is that White's knight on b1 has uh, hasn't gone to the most natural square c3, and the pawn is there instead. And the real difference is, is this pawn on c3 plays against the knight on c6. What I mean by that is that the d4 square is covered and the b4 square is covered. So the knight on c6 is relatively restricted. And that's sort of where white's advantage lies in a lot of these positions. Uh, and, just, uh, and the knight on c6 being a tiny bit misplaced. And so in many lines, it regroups to the king side by, by playing knight e7 and knight g6. And that is what actually happens in the game. But first, uh, you have to worry about this b4 threat trapping the bishop. So a6 was played, covering the bishop on, uh, giving the bishop a square on a7 to retreat to after b4. And here, b4 was played anyway by Carlson. And uh, then the bishop just dropped back all the way to a7. And uh, here, Carlson played extremely slowly, uh, playing rook e1. And I must confess that I really don't like this position. Um, it's been played uh, a few times this year. Um, it's sort of just keeping keeping White's position relatively flexible uh, by playing rookie one, not, not saying where you're going to put the bishop yet or the knight yet. But um, I really don't like the coordination of White's, uh, White's pieces right now, uh, specifically with having so many uh, of the queenside pieces still in the back rank. It's hard for me to believe that this really challenges black in any serious way. And even though white does have this queenside space, uh, remember, whenever you push any pawns, you weaken squares uh, behind uh, the behind that you actually just left the pawns on. So the whole queenside to me looks a little bit fishy. Um, uh, and really, if black is able to break in the center by playing d5, or even regroup effectively with knight e7 and knight g6, Black can actually start to play for an advantage because the lack of development here in the queen side really can tell. Another feature of the position, and the reason I don't like rookie one, is because in many positions it actually allows this knight g4 move. Uh, and here knight g4 might not be a distinct possibility because uh, uh, rookie two covers f2. Um, but I've seen a few games uh, in this line where black will play king h8. And then after uh, a move like h3 attacking the knight, sometimes there's there's even this move f5, which is a peace sacrifice, uh, but with good reason. It's sometimes after h takes g4, uh, f takes g4, there's really strong pressure against this uh, f2, this, this f3 knight. And then a lazy move, maybe like knight e1, sometimes there's even g3 tricks. So, and this and this bishop on g3 really shows its shows a nasty, nasty. Uh, its strength along this diagonal, and then you might have even ideas like queen h4 coming. So I just don't like this setup because it seems to me that that black is able to get uh, too active and develop an initiative, and this is not really what you want to go for when you're playing the Italian game, which is uh, known as the basically the quiet game. It's synonymous as being the quiet game. So again. Knight g4 wasn't played here, and I think it was just Karyakin being a little bit careful and not trying to avoid Carlson preparation. But in general, I don't I don't recommend these types of setups for White with the early uh, a with the early b4 and a4. Um, so 
Anyways, after rookie one, a Kraken played 97, which is sort of the safe and other standard procedure. If you're not going to go for this knight g4 idea, um, you go 97. And the idea is just to get the, other, the knight to g6. And then here Carlson played knight bd2, finally developing uh, this queenside uh, uh, knight. And again, I think he should have done this before going for the queenside expansion, just to keep it a little bit more flexible. Um, because now, again, with with uh, going for this queenside expansion so early, you give black extra ideas of breaking in the middle with d5. Um, and many, many, uh, many, dick, uh, many rules in chess uh, dictate that when uh, when the when someone plays on the flank, you play in the middle. And uh, so I was already thinking about when d5 could be played for black. Not yet, though, because the e5 pawn is hanging. So first, Kraken went knight g6, uh, sort of relocating the knight to that square on g6. And from g6, it, it's really effective because it eyes the f4 square, and uh, it just it you don't you can't really even effectively defend it with g3 because that would weaken. If you played a move like g3, you just weaken all these light squares. So the knight just effectively controls the f4 square. And I could I already was sort of envisioning maybe like knight h5 and knight h to f4. Um, and so uh, yeah, I, I find black has no problems here. But Carlson played uh, d4 now, so he must have had other thoughts and decided that it was time to sort of engage in the center. But I don't like it. I feel like uh, I feel like like white isn't ready yet to engage in the center because the bishop is still on c1, the queen is on d1, so the rooks aren't connected. Um, h3 hasn't been played, which is a, a typical move sometimes in these structures to sort of stop uh, something to g4. Um, and even knight f1 isn't played either, and so the knight also wants to sometimes go to g3. So I just thought I thought black was ready for this. And here, Kyokin played c6, another just effective move, uh, just sort of preparing uh, d5, which would be very annoying to come with tempo, hitting the Bishop on c4 and the pawn on e4. Here, Carlson still thought he had time to keep the tension a little bit uh, and played h3. Um, again, it's a useful move covering the g4 square, but I don't think it's exactly congruent with this queenside expansion. I keep saying this. White doesn't have time for everything, and I, I just wish the b2 pawn or the b4 pawn was back on b2 and that we, we already would have had knight f1 and knight g3 played. And then maybe you can entertain expanding on the queen side. But to sort of expand on the queen side first without developing the rest of the queen side pieces doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And now after h3, Kriakin took on d4, uh, which I thought was a smart decision because now knight takes d4 makes zero sense because the bishop would have, be sort of unopposed on this diagonal and the knight would control the e5 square. So c takes d4, which Carlson played is pretty much forced. And then uh, Kayakin played knight takes e4, uh, which was sort of a, a tactical point that you sort of can look out for in these positions because the, whichever uh, captures on e4, uh, if knight takes e4, uh, black can go d5. And in this position, pretty much has no major problems because you're going to get the piece back. And in addition to that, you're going to be playing against the isolated pawn on d4. So... Because of those factors, uh, it really um, it really didn't seem to me that uh, that White got too much out of the opening at all. Now, in this position, I can say that Bishop G5 is an idea after D5, and uh, D5 Bishop G5, you you definitely have some pressure uh, on this di on on the Queen. So, and if a move like F6 is played, then the Bishop does definitely has this influence on the diagonal. So. Um, I don't know, maybe after a move like, uh, I don't know, maybe like, uh, bishop b3 or something, uh, you might argue that after f takes g5, knight takes g5, there's some pressure here uh, on e6 or something, but it's hard for me to imagine that with this, with the, uh, one extra pawn island than, um, than black, that there should be something major here, so, I wasn't particularly impressed, um, yeah. But after knight takes e4, Carlson made another really mystifying decision. And I think it was part partly based on the fact that normal lines wouldn't really work out. 
Um, another point, though, after knight takes e4 that I failed to point out is if d5, bishop d3, uh, d takes e4, bishop takes e4, black pretty much can effectively blockade the d5, d4 pawn by playing bishop e6. And even though uh, there are many pieces on the board, I think it's a lot easier to play black because black is the more healthy pawn structure. The knight on g6 is really solid. The bishop can come to d5 and effectively blockade the square. And uh, I would already prefer to be black. Uh, but I think Carlson saw this and saw that he wasn't really getting much from the opening here and just wanted to mix it up a little bit. And that's why after um, after knight takes c4, Carlson played the in very incredible bishop takes f7 check. And I really, really didn't like this move. Uh, the point is that you, you do get this the, a, side, a pawn for the uh, for your troubles with bishop takes f7 check. So rook takes, knight takes e4, and the position is still a little bit unbalanced. Uh, with e There's even material, but you, you, sh you took away one of uh, black's uh, d uh, pawns that were defending the king. But in exchange for this, you you give up the two bishops. Uh, you, you give black an open f-file to work with. And I felt that just... As a, as a decision, it's a very short-term decision because in the long term, black will have the positional trumps with the two bishops and the more healthy pawn structure. So I just, I really, uh, I think Carlson was pressing a little bit too hard. And um, and I think this is partially emblematic of the way the, the match has gone. He sort of, you know, hasn't gotten on the board in the win column and it's perhaps maybe got, gotten a little bit frustrated as a result of that. And some of these moves just are a bit mystifying because they don't keep the tension in the position the way Carlson typically keeps tension. Um, usually it's a safe, methodical. Here, Black definitely has his fair share of chances with because it's unbalanced. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, Black definitely can play on here and, and definitely entertain playing playing for a win. So I didn't like this choice at all. After knight takes e4, though, fortunately Carlson, I mean, Karyakin follows up with a similarly mystifying move by playing d5. Now, it makes it does make some sense to sort of get the pawn at d5 and control the e4 square, but I think it really didn't, it, it, it didn't make so much sense because it also gave up the c5 square for the knight. And so Carl, Carlson willingly played knight c5. Instead, I thought bishop f5 first would have been a little bit better, just a little bit more flexible, and then decide what to do. If you want to play d5 later, fine. But these knights don't have so many great jumping posts to go to. And a move like knight g5 doesn't make too much sense, because after rook e7, the knight is lacking squares. So, yeah. Instead, d5 was played, and now knight c5. And again, now white at least can say, I gave up the two bishops, so my knight on c5 is definitely no worse than the bishop on a7 yet. So uh, I thought white actually was doing okay now. And now Kriyakin has to finish development before white uh, really starts to make use of uh, the knight being an anchor on c5. And that's why black goes for h6. Very important to cover the g5 square first, so that knight, knight g5 couldn't jump, or bishop g5 couldn't jump. And then after rook a3, a very, very clever rook transfer by Carlsen, bringing the rook to the e-file, trying to double, uh, Kriakin played bishop f5. And here's sort of the contours of the game are set. White is going to try and double rooks and maybe put a piece on e5, and black is going to try and finish development double rooks on the f-file, and then try to get something going against the king. It's interesting to see whose plan comes first. I thought the idea was to play rook a, e3 here, but again, I haven't been able to find much of any of the moves in this game when I was looking at it live. And Carlsen, for some reason, rejected uh, uh, continuing the plan with rook a, e3, and instead went knight e5. And knight e5 turns out to be a mistake. Uh, it not only looks a bit questionable, it actually is questionable. And the reason is it's, it's just losing a little bit of that coordination. The knight could have gone to e5 whenever, and to sort of rush in with knight e5 before you're fully coordinated with your rooks and your bishop on being on c1 just wasn't such a wise choice. And Kyakin took the opportunity and pounced. 
After knight takes e5, d takes e5 was played, and then queen h4. And queen h4 is a super strong move, because not only does it hit the b4 pawn, it also uh, invites the rook on a8 to rejoin uh, the action by playing a move like rook e8 or rook af8. And um, and also, it the queen on h4 really, really does a great job of pressuring the f2 pawn. So... If this bishop moves somewhere, uh, queen takes f2 check becomes a serious, serious threat. So the combination of all those ideas make it just makes it very difficult to play here. And I think the last point is is that the queen h4 is pretty difficult to dislodge. I mean, you can't really play g3 or because h3 would be hanging. You can't really push it off that square. Um, so just an effective move all around. And here Carlson was was. A little bit worse, I would say, uh, quite clearly. Being the two bishops down, not having much of an initiative going yet on the king side. I would even say black has the more solid pawn structure. Um, but uh, anyways, Carlson found a way. First, he played rook f3. Um, I think it makes some sense, uh, defending the f, over protecting the f2 pawn, and also introducing this idea of e6. So, for instance, if Queen takes b2 was played. Uh, now, uh, queen, sorry, queen takes b4. Now e6 is a move, and this rook is really doesn't have a great place to go to because if rook e7, uh, it's starting to get things are starting to get a little bit dicey. You might have a move like uh, bishop a3 come about, hitting the queen, protecting the knight, and still the bishop is attacked. Um, so queen takes b4 is sort of out of the question for the time being because e6 is such a threat. And so Koyakin played bishop takes c5. And I think now uh, giving up that bishop was a little bit premature. Instead, I think there were some other moves you could have made. Maybe move the rook somewhere uh, to just defend prophylactically against e6. Maybe play, um, maybe think consider playing rook e8. I'm not so sure, but bishop takes c5 just from a, visual standpoint did not seem too pleasing to me because after D b takes e5 now the pawn structure on the queen side for black is fixed so even though black has a uh, has a queen side pawn majority you can't actually make a pass pawn here because the c5 pawn is controlling the uh the b pawn from moving it's almost like the last game on game four where in a similar situation with black black had a pawn on c4 and then uh, and it stopped uh, white from playing, uh, moving the uh, the b2 pawn because it was backward. So I thought if anyone could be better here, it's white, because white actually has a pawn majority that can potentially be pushed long term. So anyway, rook e8 was played, uh, and now e6, the idea with bishop takes e5 is now e6 is effectively covered. So at least for the time being, black can effectively blockade on the light squares. But I thought long term, it might be tricky to manage. But then again, Karakin has proved time and time again he knows how to defend and which structures he feels comfortable with defending. So maybe he was already thinking draw here. So rook f4 was played, uh, pushing the queen away from uh, the fourth rank and sort of controlling d4 a little bit more. And after queen e7, queen d4 is played. And here, this is probably the best position Carlson has had uh, the whole game because now... He's effectively blockaded all of all of Black's queenside pawns. He has his pawn majority to work with on the king side, and I started to think, oh my, Carlson might be able to push here. Uh, might be in for another long, long game. Um, but something happened because the the contours of the position changed really quickly. So first, after Queen D4, Karakin played Rook E F8. I think it's smart, uh, again, when you're lacking space to maybe trade a, a, pair, a few pieces. And I think with this idea, with this move, uh, Koryakin is trying to play bishop e6 and trade some rooks. Uh, Koryakin, or sorry, Carlsen played rook f3. Uh, interesting move. I think in some lines the idea is maybe to keep the rooks on the board. Uh, consider playing a move like rook g3 um, and just sort of... Again, not trading these heavy pieces because white is the one that has the space advantage right now. But bishop e4 was played, and now uh, the rook had to make a tough, a, a pretty easy decision actually. And rook takes f7 was played because a move like rook g3 allows black to go for rook takes f2, 
And even though we say typically that uh, two rooks are okay for a queen and pawn, here uh, the rest of uh, white's pawns are just are, are just too weak and become become targets. And a move like queen takes c5 check, black is already in the driver's seat and just winning. So giving the queen for the two rooks was not possible here. So after rook takes f7, which is forced, queen takes f7, uh, a pair of rooks have been exchanged, and I think that's in uh, in uh, Kayakin's favor. But Carlson still has a, a tiny edge because he has more space. And here he plays f3. Good move. Dislodging the bishop from the strong e4 square where it's an anchor, and sort of establishing your pawns on light squares here, which is a pretty good idea uh, just to, because it restricts the bishop, uh, the light square bishop on e4, and will restrict it on other diagonals as well. So now bishop f5 was played, and then we had king h2. Another good move in my estimation, essentially just tucking the king away. King h2 is a typical uh, Kasparov move, actually. Many times in many of his famous attacking games, he plays a prophylactic move before he advances his pawns, or goes in for the kill. And although Carlson isn't winning here or anything like that, I think King H2 does sort of partially describe his intentions of of expand of expanding on the king side with his pawns by playing G4 and F4. Now it is a bit curious. Maybe uh, maybe you could have gone G4 right away, uh, but maybe not because it, it, you can you can imagine that perhaps it, it's a little bit too risky to expand while the F3 pawn can still be a target. So uh, he just tucks the king away first. So King H2. And now we had bishop e6, and this is why I was suggesting maybe g4 first, because if we go back here, here of g4, the bishop goes back, now white can play f4 and um, and is already threatening f5. And here, after king h2, bishop e6, f4, uh, or g4 is impossible anymore because the f3 pawn is hanging. So... You can't exactly get the pawns rolling here, but I'm sure there was some tactical problem that prevented g4 and f4 from happening before. So after bishop e6, Carlson went rook e2. Again, just keeping it cool, not committing to anything, sort of seeing how black is going to uh, establish uh, a, the defensive setup. Then queen g6, effective move, moving the queen to a diagonal where it can, it's doing a little bit more work. And, um, and also... Uh, sort of keeping an eye on the, the king side as well. And uh, I just want to point out here also, I think if you sort of have to think about what sort of dream structures or dream positions or dream exchanges white would like to have. And to me, to my eye, white would love to have the queens traded. Because if the queens were traded, then then white can more easily expand on the, on the king side without fearing checkmate. And so I think basically what Sergei is doing is saying, Okay, fine. I'm gonna sit. I mean, I'm gonna wait. But you can't exactly get your 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 initiative going with the pawn pushes, uh, with the queens on the board because it's too dangerous. Interestingly enough, Carlson just does it anyway, and here he plays bishop e3, shoring up the king side just a little bit more, but is about to expand. And let's just zip through a few moves just to see how that happens. Rook f7, another waiting move. Rook f2. Slowly preparing the push. Queen b1, just, just sort of a pass, maybe eyeing the queen side a little bit, but nothing major. Rook b2, harassing, queen back. a5, this is a great move, fixing uh, the queen side, uh, black's queen side structure. So now only white has pawn, only white has pawn breaks, and that's important. King f8. Queen c3, and now king e8. And I'm going to stop here because you see there's some, uh, there's sort of a buildup happening with the preparation for eventual break. But Kryakin is such a clever defender. And moving the king away uh, from where the pawn storm is going to be is very clever because uh, now if the king can sort of waltz over to c8, uh, what winds up happening is that. Uh, Black can start to push his own pawns on the king side without fear of reprisal. So uh, now that the Black King is sort of is sort of uh, running away from the king side, Black can push his own king side pawns and take some space without being so fearful of an attack. And so just really, really clever, King F8, King E8. 
And now Carlson decides, I got to get it going before the king gets totally safe. So he plays rook b4, g5, rook b2, king d8, rook f2, king c8, queen d4, queen g6, and finally g4. But I think the difference here is profound because the king, I think Dwight would have much rather had the king be on g8 where it was a bit weaker. Uh, now on c8, it's pretty secure, and it's pretty hard to imagine uh, white pushing the pawns, getting the effect an effective break in the game, and simultaneously having a safe king. So just I think the past like five to eight moves of maneuvering have been victory Karyakin because he was able to secure his king while Carlson was sort of patiently probing. And this is another thing that sort of stuck, stuck out in the match. While Carlsen has been probing, Koyakin has actually made effective moves. Uh, in other, other opponents that Carlsen has played that he usually probes against, they sort of don't do anything while the probing is going on, and that's why they fall into trouble. Koyakin just does not do that. And so after g4, he plays h5, and it's so consistent with what he's been doing the whole match. As soon as... Uh, Carlson does something that changes the contours of the position. Kayakin answers a question and actively answers the question. I'm really curious to know how he prepared for the match uh, to deal with this sort of way that Carlson plays because he's just done a great job of dealing with it. So h5 just is a clever move, sort of making White think twice about f4 and sort of attacking the chain. And... White played queen d2, attacking the d4, the g5 pawn. But after eight, uh, after rook g7, the g5 pawn is protected, and it's hard to imagine White being able to break through here because the king would just be too weak. And but you know, Carlson tries. That's what he does. Even when it seems like there's nothing going on, he keeps going. And so he played king g3. Uh, I guess maybe to pro provoke h4 check, but that wasn't going to happen. Uh, Rook g8, just keeping the tension, getting to move for 40, so now they both get extra time and can, uh, you know, get some water or a snack or whatever. And now king g2, just patiently sitting. And now h takes g4. And again, white has no advantage here. Uh, h takes g4. And now d4. And here, Kayakin decides to seize the chance. Um... Very strong move, and I'm sure was missed by Carlson, uh, because in opposite called bishop endings, or middle games, really, a lot of the time it comes down to the activity of the bishops. When there are other pieces on the board, the activity of the bishops will dictate the evaluation of the position. In this case, this d4 pawn sacrifice activates the e6 bishop uh, by putting it on d5. And now after queen takes d4, bishop d5, this bishop is eyeing this king very uncomfortably on this diagonal, and the bishop on the e3 is hardly doing the same against the king on c8. Many commentators here were actually suggesting that black was in, or black was just in a, clearly in the driver's seat, and that white was in deep, deep trouble. But Carlson is a resourceful defender too, and he and he mixed it up by playing e6, giving the pawn back. The point is by giving the pawn back you sort of clear the way for some dark squares uh, for black, or for white to deal with, uh, and just sort of get some counterplay. In this position, if white sort of sat and did nothing, black had a very clear plan of going rook h8 and queen h6, and then going queen h1 mate. And there really wouldn't have been much to do against it besides evacu evacuating the king, and that would have been a very, very dangerous proposition. But with this e6 move, he at least, you know, asks Sergey some questions about how you're how you're gonna deal with this pawn. Are you gonna take it? Which way you're gonna take it? And for the time being, the queen on d4 covers the h8 square. Queen takes h e6 was played, and that was probably a mistake. The reason why it was a mistake is that it just moved the queen a little bit away from uh, activity on the h file. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure instead what black should have done, to be honest, but queen takes e6 just didn't feel right to me because you're just moving a little bit away uh, from from the plan of maybe doubling on the h-bar. Instead, maybe uh, 
I don't know, rook e8, or, I don't know, maybe even bishop takes e6, but queen takes e6 is fair enough. And then king g3, uh, very, very clever move, and just alert, alert by uh, Carlsen, uh, sort of seeing uh, that a uh, queen and rook could potentially occupy the h ball quickly, he's trying to get his rook to h2 before any of that funny business can happen. And it's quite clear here that Carlsen is, is the one playing for the draw. If anyone can do anything, it's black. Uh, that said, at the same time, if the queens are traded, uh, then white would be in the driver's seat because, uh, again, white has uh, black has no pawn breaks on the queen side uh, because of the structure, and the g5 pawn could be weak. So it's interesting to see how the dynamics of the position change based on certain exchanges. Like the like, like so again, if the queens get off, white is much better, close to winning. If the queens uh, stay on, <laughs> Black, white has to fight for a draw because his king is too weak. So, queen e7 was played, uh, I think a decent move, covering the g5, uh, pawn, and maybe hinting at, at, uh, a moving the rook on g8 somewhere where it's more active. And now rook h2. And here, this is sort of the last move, key defensing move, uh, Carlson needed to make to sort of secure an equal position. The point is that now there's no way to trade the rooks with rook h8. Uh, or no, there's no way to avoid the trade of rooks with rook h8. And once the rooks come off, uh, there's really no attack anymore with just black just having the queen and the bishop. So queen f7 was played, hitting the f3 pawn. Uh, and now Carlson played f4, uh, which seems a little bit mystifying because you weaken your king a little bit more after it. Uh, G takes f4, bishop, queen takes f4, but the point is is that uh, you could trade queens or even trade rooks and it becomes a draw. And so black has, white has enough pieces around the king now where uh, and where he could pretty much secure the draw. And furthermore, now this queen is on f4, the king actually can't scurry away to b8 or a8, and so the king's actually relatively open now. So queen takes f4, queen e7, Rook h5, uh, with the idea, I think, of rook e5. Uh, rook f8. And now it looks like white is in a, a world of trouble, a world of pain, because if the queen moves, there's rook f3 check picking off the e3 bishop. But uh, Carlson saw a bit further here and played rook h7. And this forces the trade of queens in nice, an attack, nice tactical way. The point is that if queen takes h7... Queen takes f8 check, and uh, if anyone's better here, it's white, uh, because uh, king c7 would come with, uh, would be answered by bishop f4 check, um, with probably close to winning position, actually. Um, and if king d7, there's queen d6 check, and then some bishop move after that. So, so yeah, so... After rook h7, rook takes f4 was played, rook takes e7, protects the bishop on e3, very important, so that rook f3 check doesn't come decisively. And now, rook e4, rook take was, rook e4 is played, and here they agree to a draw. Uh, you guys might be asking here, why did they agree to a draw here when white is the one with the outside pass pawn? Well, it's because the opposite called bishops. The point is that after this rook trade, which is forced now, uh, rook takes e4, bishop takes e4, uh, black can effectively get the king to g8 before white gets his king active. So king f4, I don't know, bishop somewhere, bishop c2, I guess. King e5, king d7, king f6, king e8. And yeah, essentially, I think the king will get to g8 quickly enough. Um, bishop h6 would have to be played here to stop the king from going to f8. And, yeah, and then the bishop can just stay, can just stay on this diagonal. Bishop b3 and f g5, bishop c4, g6, bishop b3. There's just no way to, to, uh, meaningfully push the pawn. Although it looks like I'm... Yeah, the point is that the king, if the king goes to g7... Uh, now very important move, uh, bishop c2. And the point is the king can't actually go further, uh, the king can't actually go to e8 or g8 
without without losing or sorry g8 or h8 without losing the g6 pawn so the point is that after king h7 king e7 uh, just bishop c bishop d3 and this pin protect prevents the, the the pawn from being pushed further so that would be a draw and the other thing is that if g7 is played then bishop g8 and you can never actually break through you can never support uh, you can't ever actually play g8 because the king will never get to h8 or f8 for that to happen. So that's why uh, that's why this opposite colored bishop endgame, where white has a pass pawn and an active king, is still a draw. So, yeah, so after rook, rook e4, these players are just so strong and know, they sort of understand that it's, a, it's an equal position, that's a draw. So if they played it out, it would have been for sort of the spectators and not sort of for the purpose of the result changing. So what do we learn from this game? Um, I was very, very disappointed in Carlson's play today. Um, and I'm starting to think Kayakin might have a bit of an upper hand, um, simply because you'd like to think that after the past two games where Carlson put real pressure on Kayakin, that he'd be able to do the same here, and that just wasn't the case at all. Uh, at some point, he was actually seriously worse, uh, which is also not a great sign, um, particularly with the white pieces. But it's really emblematic of, I think, the way that Kriakin is frustrating Carlson a little bit. Um, Carlson has not been able to put him away in sort of the positions where he's done really well. So now he's just trying to push him, put him away by getting him, in, getting him into unfamiliar territory. The problem is, is some of this unfamiliar, unfamiliar territory he's putting Kriakin in it's just dubious. It's just incorrect. And so because of that, Kayakin just needs to find one or two moves uh, to so sort of correct the strangeness of the position. And then he's actually on equal footing. And so I think Carlson needs to be very careful not to get away from his style of chess. I've said in uh, previous videos, and um, I even said on some forums as well, uh, that Carlson will, will not lose this match if he plays to his style, if he sticks to it. If he gets frustrated he will and changes the way he plays, that's when he can be vulnerable. It's very important that Carlson plays to his style, which is the slow, methodical, war of attrition grind. If he plays moves like bishop takes f7, check, he's not going to win the match. If he plays moves like knight e5, where he bum rushed in with the knight too quickly, he's not going to win the match because he's going to get punished at some point for playing moves that aren't congruent with his style. So keep in mind, before this game, Carlson had pretty much been the better player in the opening, the middle game, and the end game. He just hadn't won the games. So I think that's important to note that every phase, it's been advantage Carlson, so stick with that. But now the match is turned, we're going to have... Uh, a game tomorrow uh, uh, where Carlson will be black, and then another game on Sunday after the Saturday rest day where Carlson will be black again. And so Karyakin is going to have two white games now, and I'm sure that in at least one of them, Carlson is going to be under heavy pressure. So if I could make any predictions, and my predictions have just been totally off this match so far, I think there's going to be a decisive game in, the next, in one of the next two games. Because Kraken's going to have two cracks with white to really make something happen. Um, and that's why I think it's so disappointing this uh, for Carlson that this was sort of a, a draw without much pressure for black. Because now he's going to have to defend the black pieces twice in a row. And psychologically, that's going to be tough. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, thanks for tuning in. And um, I'll uh, be back soon.